Um, so we talked about learning and memory. Kind of an ironic topic. You probably break out a little bit. Um, this one is one that um, I'm a neuropsychologist, and we kind of got our claim to fame on our understanding of two things. One being memory, and the other thing being language functions. Uh, and so we know a lot about this relative to other things. Um, I am putting this in as a shorter lecture. Um, it is really interesting in a broader kind of sense. When you talk to people in my field, they often talk about memory in a very constrained kind of sense, meaning uh, specific kinds of episodic declarative memories, like me reading a list of words to you and asking you to read, tell me the words back. But in a broader sense, memory is the way that the brain develops in a lot of, in, in a lot of ways. Memory and learning are the ways that the brain changes over time, and a lot of people are really interested in things like synaptic plasticity and how it affects people's ability to um, uh, recover from serious injuries, for instance. Synaptic plasticity, in, in essence, is a form of learning, and in order to understand how the brain can change, um, this field is really important. Uh, and so it does have a lot to do with things outside of psychology, uh, like neurorehabilitation. So what I want to try to sell you on today is the, a broader concept of what learning is. Uh, in essence, we define learning as a response to an experience that changes the organism, resulting in changes in future behavior. And so it's these two key pieces, or well, three key pieces. One, that it's a response to an experience. Two, that it changes the organism. And three, that it results in changes in future behavior. And so for instance, um, if a uh, rodent um, sees a um, uh, three, um, three tunnels, say, and going to the left tunnel uh, leads to a piece of cheese, and the next time the rodent sees three tunnels, they go into the left tunnel again, it's in response to an experience, it changes the organism, and it results in a change in future behavior. This change in the organism part, I didn't explain that example, but we presume something must have changed inside the rodent to cause the rodent to engage in a consistently different behavior. It's not a direct perceptual response in that example, hypothetically, because the rodent can't see the piece of cheese at the end of the tunnel. So it has to know, it has to have done some kind of learning. But I also apply this to um, uh, if you, um, if you, um, uh, file your taxes and you neglect to report a certain source of income and then you get audited by the IRS, then you don't do that next year for tax season. That's also similarly a learning experience. Um, so that's learning in a broad uh, con context. Is It's a response to the environment. It changes the organism. It results in changes in future behavior that are predictable. And that's how we define memory and learning operationally. And there are lots of different ways to break memory up into components. Um, one of the major uh, constructual divisions that psychologists make is between non-declarative and declarative memory. And non-declarative memory are things like your perceptual learning, like your sensory traces, uh, your motor learning, uh, your stimulus response and conditioned learning. Um, so for instance, the kind of learning that uh, explains why the second time you got on your bicycle you were less shaky than the first time is not a declarative kind of memory or learning. In contrast, there are declarative memories, like episodic memories, like I remember um, uh, I remember that last night um, uh, Mitt Romney made a gaffe about a, a binder full of women. Uh, that's an episodic memory. There's a specific instant. I remember someone saying something. Uh, if uh, you remember that I told you that just a moment ago, that's an episodic memory as well. And then we'll talk about semantic memories, which are essentially memories for facts that are not tied to specific events. So we'll talk about all of these. Um, but I want to mention that there are lots of different ways to break memory up. Um, you can divide it into sensory and motor components of memory. You can divide it into declarative and non-declarative uh, components of memory. Uh, and as you add all of this up, it really involves the whole brain, although there are some structures that are particularly important in learning that we'll be talking about today. So let me start by just reinforcing that idea of declarative and non-declarative memory. Um, declarative memory means that the memory is explicitly available to conscious recollection as facts, events, or specific stimuli. Um, 
if you're thinking like a psychologist already, you have concerns about this because as a psychologist you ask, well, what on earth does conscious recollection mean? Um, we operationalize this oftentimes as these are memories that you can recite, memories that you can report or recognize. And so, uh, for instance, a conscious recollection would be, for instance, if I ask you, uh, what's the president, first president of the United States of America, you can give me an answer. Um, as opposed to, uh, well, the riding a bicycle example I used in the previous slide. You can tell me mechanistically how one goes about riding a bicycle, but I'm sure if you've ever tried to do that, you recognize right away that your word description of how to ride a bicycle is terrible, right? It really doesn't convey what it's like to ride a bicycle. And it conveys the fact that that's really not a declarative memory. There's no way to explain in words how it is that you know how to ride a bicycle. You just do. Um, so non-declarative memory includes all kinds of automated learning, uh, including classical and, and operant conditioning and basic sensory and motor learning. Um, so Pavlov's dog, uh, who salivated for um, the bell because he salivated for the steak, that's classical conditioning that's a non-declarative memory. Um, humans, we engage in that same kind of learning, like um, they learn to wake up a couple minutes before their alarm clock goes off. That's a non-declarative kind of memory. And that's a good example, because you don't even have to be awake to declare anything uh, for that to work. So as an example in principle, just to think about this, suppose that uh, you had pancakes uh, for breakfast every day for a week. And just suppose conceptually for the sake of argument that it's possible to be satiated, so you're sick of pancakes in essence. A declarative memory would be that you remember that you had pancakes all last week and you say, hey, I had pancakes for seven days in a row now. I don't want them anymore. That's a declarative memory. You may also just sit in front of the pancakes and, and smell them and see them and, and have this visceral response that says, not in words, but in feeling, I don't want pancakes, that non-word, uh, non-conscious, whatever that means, recollection, uh, that you don't even realize is happening, uh, maybe you just gag when you see a pancake, that's a non-declarative memory. And so in this case, you're having declarative and non-declarative memories about the same thing. Uh, but this may help you remember which one is which. So perceptual learning is a non-declarative kind of memory. Perceptual learning has to do with strengthening patterns of neuronal firing in the sensory cortex based on previously experienced stimuli. Um, so this function handles things like novelty. Like if you've seen a face before, that trace, the neurons that fire in response to that face have fired before. And the change that has occurred as a result of that allows you to tell that that's an old face and not a new face. And that's what I mean by novelty. So infants develop the skill right away. Uh, very early in life, an infant can demonstrate that it can tell the difference between a previously presented face and a novel face. Uh, and the way that you know that is not because they tell you, but because they um, change the amount of time they spend looking at the face. Uh, they, look at, they respond to novelty, for instance, as they look more at faces they've never seen before. They look less at faces they already saw. Uh, and then in an adult, you could show them a face, and then later you could show them three faces and ask them out the one they saw, and that would be a test of the same thing in an adult. That would be more sophisticated. It also accounts for generalization. So this is a kind of hokey example, but one thing you can all do is when you see script or cursive letters, you see block letters, you understand that they convey the same meaning. Um, and you don't have to translate in your head this cursive into the block letters you're able to uh, recognize them using perceptual learning tools in an automated kind of fashion. So in essence, uh, when someone has a sensory experience, what happens is that for a brief period on the order of seconds, that trace, all the neurons that fire, that tell you about, uh, that tell you about the sensory experience, um, those are neurons, say this is a visual experience. Those are neurons in the visual cortex and the visual association areas. That trace remains active for a very short period of time. And this is basic or raw attention. Um, and you can 
prime this, you can focus your attention using executive functions in the frontal lobe to make this a little bit longer, but this is kind of raw attention. Um, there's an executive function that allows essentially for these traces to be kept alive. So if I try to draw this for you really, really schematically, just quickly, because um, this might be a strange concept. Um, so suppose that this is your brain, so a really, really rough picture, and the visual cortex is back here, right? And there's visual association areas in your where your what and your where streams, right? So suppose that you see the cover of a specific book, like this textbook that you're familiar with. Suppose that it lights up a pattern of neurons. Um, and since I'm talking about a what event, because you're recognizing a textbook, as opposed to where the textbook is, it's down here. Suppose that in some kind of very hand-waving way, all these neurons are firing. There's a neuron here, and a neuron here, and a neuron here. Who knows, maybe this is five neurons, maybe it's 5,000 neurons, but these neurons all fire in a pattern that's unique to this book when you see it. And this is a different pattern than if you see another book. Um, say you see The Hunger Games. The Hunger Games book generates this other pattern, right? And I'm doing this in a total hand-waving way, but I'm saying that these neurons fire in a pattern that is, uh, that is a recognition of that stimulus. So what I'm saying here is that for a couple seconds, this trace is just going as a result of seeing that image. But you can also use the frontal lobe to keep it alive so that these, these neurons keep firing in that same pattern. And for instance, um, so you've all done this. You've all been given a phone number, for instance. And, and maybe you do even something slightly more complicated, but the phone number is um, 301-6800 or something like that. And so you're saying to yourself, 301 301 You're saying that phone number over and over again to remember it, right? So during that time, what you're doing is essentially you're keeping that, that sensory trace alive. In this case, it's an auditory trace for the, the, the sound. If you're trying to remember what the book looks like, you're keeping a visual trace alive during that time. And what I mean by keeping a trace alive is that that same set of neurons that were involved in recognizing that book or that set of numbers keeps firing while you pay attention to it. And that's called sustained attention. This executive process where you uh, persist uh, a, motor, a, a sensory and motor trace in order to, to, keep, to keep from forgetting it, essentially. Because this, this raw attention will go away in a couple seconds. Um, so, sorry, please, I didn't, it was kind of hard to predict when people would be done, but we got started just a couple minutes ago. We're still on like slide three or so. Um, and we're talking about declarative and non declarative memory. In essence, declarative memory means uh, that there's an explicit fact or event, something you can consciously recollect, like uh, like the president, the first president of the United States is George Washington, or five plus five equals ten, or um, yesterday I had a, a, a banana for lunch. Those are all declarative memories. Non-declarative memories are things like conditioning, like the reason that you rode your bike more steadily the second day that you learned to ride a bike than the first day is a non-declarative kind of learning process. The classical conditioning, like Pavlov's bell, uh, the dog salivated for the bell after salivating for the steak, that's also um, a non-declarative memory. There's no event or fact that you're recalling or recognizing. So in the non-declarative realm, we'll talk about that first. We talk about perceptual learning. This is essentially sensory learning. And it's essentially caused by pattern firing of neurons in sensory association processes. <laughs> and so for instance, if a pattern of neurons fires that causes you to recognize your textbook, what's happening for a couple seconds is that pattern keeps firing, and that raw attention allows you to remember that visual image. You, know, you probably have kind of a, a, a casual experience of this, that you're looking at something and you see it, and you close your eyes and for a moment you can still see it. Unless you try to keep that alive, it doesn't last very long. But your executive functions in your frontal lobe can be used to regulate that and sustain it. And then as long as you're not distracted, and to some extent even if you are distracted, 
you can keep that memory for a little while. Um, in this way, sensory memory essentially involves reactivation of that same trace, the same neurons that recognize the, the thing the first in the first place. And so this is an important organizing principle. This sensory memory is occurring in the same place of the brain that the sense, that's the sense occurred in the brain. It's not occurring in some other structure. So you have visual cortex that allows you to see. You don't have some other brain structure somewhere else that stores the visual information. That visual cortex that allowed you to see it in the first place is the same place where it's stored. So, consistent with this, if you take a monkey and you train them to detect a small visual difference in just one place in the retina, uh, that doesn't generalize. So the learning happened only in that one part of the visual field, and that one part of the visual cortex that handles that one part of the visual field is the place where that perceptual learning to, to recognize the small visual difference like the difference between this textbook and another textbook is specifically coded in that part of the visual field. Now, it's a little bit more sophisticated than you, and, and if you were trying to do this, it probably wouldn't be specific to that one place in the red note. But this suggests that um, the learning happened in the visual field cortex and not somewhere else. People who have their visual or auditory association cortices stimulated during epilepsy surgery also report that it causes spontaneous memories of images or sounds. And kind of consistent with this is what we said um, a few lectures ago about monkeys' motor cortices, cortices being stimulated. This was on the exam. Uh, when you stimulate that motor cortex, it causes a complex behavior like grasping and bringing to the mouth. So it's, that's a motor memory, right? And so in a similar way, stimulating sensory cortex causes the experience of remembering uh, in that same um, uh, sensory domain, like if the auditory cortex is stimulated, you remember a sound. If the visual cortex is stimulated, you uh, remember an image. And then finally, damage to visuoperceptual structures impairs memory of properties of familiar stimuli. So you have structures like in your what stream that allow you to tell you things like a sofa has arms on the side and four legs on the bottom and cushions and an apple is configured in such a way that it has a stem at the top and it's you know, shaped kind of like this. So the structure of these familiar stimuli uh, are actually coded in these visual perceptual processes where you recognize the same things. And so if you damage these structures and you ask someone to tell you what a sofa is structured, like they actually can't tell you that very well. Or if you do a lot of these similar kinds of things, you know, what is a desk, how is a desk made, or so forth, they'll have trouble doing this. And this all suggests that the perceptual learning is stored in the same place where the perception occurred in the first place. Um, just to reinforce this idea, this is not in the book, I don't think, but the Badley and Hitch model of um, uh, attention is a fairly famous one uh, in cognitive neuroscience and neuropsychology. And the idea is, again, that in your sensory domains, you have essentially what amounts to something like a sketch pad for visual information. Sort of like your brain draws a picture or takes a photograph of that information. And you have in the model what's called a phonological scribe, sort of like a tape recorder for auditory information. That tape recorder is what's remembering, like your, you probably heard an intro psych of the five plus or two rule five plus or minus two rule, like you can remember five plus or minus two digits, uh, and you can do the same thing spatially um, in terms of your attention. That's the phonological scribe. The central executive, though, can do some tricks to modulate this, like it can keep this alive so it doesn't immediately get erased. It can also do things like chunk information together. So your auditory attention is, is on the order of five, six, seven, eight numbers, right? But most of you can remember a 10-digit phone number that someone tells you pretty readily, even often if they tell it to you once. And the reason is because you chunk and you use the information content. For instance, if someone's telling you a phone number, it's going to have a prefix area code like um, 616 or 313 or 248 or, you know, a fairly small number of predictable ones. It's going to be much harder to remember a 10-digit phone number with an arbitrary um, area code that you're not familiar with. Oftentimes, if it's a phone number in this area, you'll recognize not only the 616 part, but even the, the next three digits will be fairly familiar. 
you just have to remember that it's 616 and not 313, or it's 498 and not 458. And so in that way, you can chunk the information together, and you can use the known properties uh, of it to help you make this scribe more efficient or this sketchpad photograph more efficient. And those functions are central executive functions, and they're frontal lobe functions, generally speaking. Or there are other structures that work with the frontal lobe do executive functions. So that's perceptual learning. What I want to turn to next is um, to review conditioning again and talk about how it relates to what we're just talking about here with learning. Any questions first about the perceptual part of learning? OK, it's recorded. All right, so conditioning. And I'll show you in a second why I'm bringing this up next. Classical conditioning we talked about in the context of fear last week. Classical conditioning means that an unimportant, um, not leading to a specific behavior kind of stimulus becomes paired with an already important one, meaning the already important stimulus has a natural response. So steak produces a natural response of salivation, but the bell does not produce a natural response. So just to review, the unconditioned stimulus is paired with the conditioned stimulus which comes after, or later in the process, and not before. And the result is that the original unconditioned response becomes associated with the conditioned stimulus, which generates the conditioned response. So in the Pavlov's dog example, the conditioned response is sal salivating in response to the bell instead of the food. Um, in the fear example, the conditioned response is responding to the tone instead of to the pop of air. And this is that picture from last week, again, this is the unconditioned stimulus. This is the, I'm sorry, this is the conditioned stimulus. This is the unconditioned stimulus, meaning the rat jumps for the shock without being trained, but it doesn't jump for the tone. And so you pair them. The unconditioned stimulus comes at the end, not before. And what happens is, as the rat learns, they start jumping for the tone, right? The rat's really smart and realizes that the tone needs to last for about 10 seconds and doesn't do anything until here, and it jumps, right? But the rat jumps in response to the tone. So that's, that's a conditioning paradigm, classical conditioning. Um, and now what I want to do this week is explain how that works and also how operant conditioning works. So uh, the really important concept here is called the Hebb rule. And it's named after a person named Donald Hebb in neuroscience. And the Hebb rule essentially states that if a synapse becomes repeatedly active at about the same time that the postsynaptic neuron actually fires, then that synapse with that presynaptic neuron will be strengthened. Meaning, if a neuron's in the right place at the right time, then the synapse gets strengthened. Um, at the time that Hebb produced, produce this rule, there was no explanation for why this would be true, and it wasn't actually even clear if it was true. But it turns out that later in the 60s, uh, the NMDA receptor explains that this is true and explains how it works. But this rule is a really important one, so I want to make sure you understand what it means. Um, here's a picture. So we use the, the fear response example that we had before, right? So this neuron is the downstream postsynaptic neuron. These two neurons are the presynaptic neurons. And what I'm, in this model then, this neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, what it does is it triggers the blink response, right? So like there's a puff of air, you blink. So here, this one is the unconditioned stimulus, the puff of air. This neuron detects the pump of air. It sends a signal. This signal was already strong because you naturally blink in response to uh, uh, a pump of air. And what I mean by strong is that when this neuron releases um, chemical into the, the synapse, there are lots of receptors here. And so the effect on the, um, the postsynaptic potential is large. So this is the strong response. What the HEP rule says is if this neuron for the kilohertz tone, which is the weak response, not naturally paired to blinking, if it happens to be repeatedly firing at the same time, 
that this strong one causes this to actually fire, causes an action potential here, then this synapse will get strengthened because it's firing during, it's firing at the same time that this one is causing to have an action potential. So then this gets progressively strengthened over time. This neuron has a larger impact on this neuron. And then pretty soon, firing of this neuron, which happened in response to the tone, causes an eye blink. Okay? So that was the missing piece of how this fear response worked that we talked about last week. And then there's one more missing piece, which is to explain to you how NMDA receptors can make this possible. First thing I want to emphasize is this is not a cortical process. The cortex is not really responsive, necessary for classical conditioning. It's a very basic kind of response, and it's done in very simple animals. Um, and the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus both synapse in the lateral nucleus. So the lateral nucleus of the amygdala in this example is where this neuron is located. When the strong stimulus triggers an action potential, the weak stimulus neuron is firing at the same time, then it's, the weak neuron is strengthened. That was the head rule that I just walked you through. And there's some support for this, including the fact that the lateral nucleus, if it's lesion, disrupts learning condition responses. And if it's temporarily inhibited, like by a drug that temporarily causes lots of inhibitory activity in the lateral nucleus, then again, unconditioned and conditioned stimuli don't pair, and so condition responses don't develop. But then once this temporary inhibition goes away, that effect goes away as well. So here's that same picture in essence. Again, you've got the weak neuron, weak neuron and the strong neuron, and the synapse. This neuron in the lateral nucleus is actually going through a more complicated process, but ultimately the result of this lateral um, nucleus neuron is that fear response like the eye blink or the startle or whatever it is, is happening after the fact here. Um, all we've done here really is to emphasize that this is happening, the synapse is happening in the lateral nucleus of the amygdala, which if you remember was the input nucleus of the amygdala. All the cortical innervation into the amygdala system is happening here, then it goes this way, and then there's output. And there's also output this way. So, Classical conditioning, again, follows the Hebb rule. It happens because these two neurons already synapsed here, but the weak one gets strengthened because it happened to be firing at the same time that the strong one caused an action potential on this, up, uh, this downstream neuron. That's how classical conditioning works. Well, let's talk, let's uh, briefly describe operant or instrumental conditioning next, and we'll bring this together and talk about how uh, different kinds of glutamate receptors are, are responsible for all of this. So the second major conditioning paradigm, hopefully familiar to you, is operant or instrumental conditioning. Same thing. Um, so this is the other kind of conditioning. Uh, classical conditioning, a naturally occurring behavior was elicited by a new source. For instance, dogs already salivate. The new source was the bell. Um, rats already blink. The new source was the tone. Um, and you know so forth like uh, people already gag but the new source was the pancakes in the earlier example so these are all naturally occurring responses that are listed by a new, store, new source operant conditioning kind of turns it on its head a naturally rewarding outcome increases the frequency of a new behavior um, or, de or an unrewarding outcome decreases uh, the frequency of the new behavior. So an example of operant conditioning is um, uh, you come home and you take your shoes off before walking into the house and your mom um, you know, bakes you cookies. Then the next time you come home, you, you take your shoes off again. That's operant conditioning. Because taking your shoes off is not, a natural, is not in this kind of sense, a naturally occurring behavior. It's, it's reward-driven. The cookies are the re reinforcer. In this lexicon, if a consequence of a behavior causes the behavior to increase in frequency, it's called a reinforcer. Um, and if a consequence of a behavior causes the behavior to decrease in frequency, it's called a punisher. That's a really important concept. 
um, in behavioral approaches, that these are the definitions of a reinforcer and a punisher. So punishment doesn't mean necessarily what you would classically consider punishment. Like it doesn't necessarily have to take the form of yelling at someone or hitting them or uh, locking them in the room or something like that. It could be something that doesn't, on the surface, look like a punishment, but if it happens as a consequence of the behavior and the behavior decreases in frequency, it's a punisher. That's the behavioral definition, definition of punishment. Um, so for instance, um, you probably have met somebody who has like a paradoxical response to things, like, like every time uh, you tell them they look nice, they get upset at you, right? Which is not the normal response to telling someone they look nice for most people. So in that case, if they t if you tell them you they they look nice, and um, say like every time they come over to ask you a question, you tell them they look nice, and that causes them to come over less and less often to ask you questions. You telling them they look nice is a punishment in a behavioral vernacular, because the result is a decrease in the, fre in the frequency of the behavior. Um, similarly. Um, in principle, you could give a kid a piece of candy every time they answer a question correctly. If they start answering less and less questions correctly for some reason, because they don't like candy, or it smells bad, or something like that, the candy functions as a punishment and not a reinforcer. So, operant condition, and the reason that I'm putting all this together is, we talked about perceptual learning, which is just traces of neural circuitry in the perceptual system. Motor learning, analogously, is just traces of motor in the motor system in a similar kind of way. Operant conditioning put these, puts these two together. So um, here is a really simple example where, say, a monkey is in a cage and it has a lever, and when it pulls the lever, a little more slow the food comes down. So first of all, there needs to be a perceptual process detecting that the lever is there, that's the stimulus. There has to be a motor process pulling the lever. Operant conditioning is tying these two together. So when you see the lever and you pull the lever, you get food. That reinforces it. That causes you to be more likely to pull the lever when you see the lever. So it's a connection between motor and perceptual learning. Does that make sense? So motor learning can be explained via conditioning to some extent. Uh, so our model of motor learning is essentially that sensory learning allows for recognition of relevant stimuli. Instrumental conditioning results in association of that stimuli with a response. And then our result is learning a motor pattern. And so uh, as you're learning to ride your bicycle, you realize that every time the pedal is at the top, if you push your leg forward and down, the bike will keep moving forward in a smooth fashion, but if you push your leg back, the bike will stop. That's a uh, conditioned motor learning. The, re the reinforcement, the reward is that the bike keeps moving smoothly. You don't, or you could view that as removal and a, you could view that as negative reinforcement if you wanted to. It's wobbly and it feels uncomfortable when you're not riding steadily. That's decreased when you ride steadily. Either way, you're reinforcing the behavior and so the next time you're like the pedals at the top, you push forward and down, that's motor learning. So if we put that all together, essentially, you see a stimulus, you detect it and you understand it, and you pair it with a specific motor response, which has a specific outcome, and the feedback process can shape up more complicated outcomes. For instance, you recognize not only that you should put the, push the pedal forward and down when it's at the top, but when it's in the, uh, I guess, like the 9 o'clock position, like dead forward, you just have to push it down. When it's at the bottom, you have to pull it back. When it's at the 3 o'clock position, you have to pull it back and up, right? And so you put all of that together, and you're pedaling the bicycle. And that's a, mo that's a clear example of motor learning. Um, you recognize that you have to put the key in the lock and turn it, and so now it's a complicated behavior that you're engaging in, but it's still motor learning that can be mediated by this process. So, as I noted, when Hemp proposed the rule that explains this, he didn't know how it worked. He didn't even know if it was true 
although it turned out that it did work and it was true. And in the 60s, a mechanism was found for that called long-term potentiation, which is really a sea change in the way that we understand sort of the brain. Um, and that process occurs in many places in the brain. It was really first understood in the hippocampus, uh, which is really a core memory structure. So the hippocampus, that's that seahorse-shaped structure, um, receives input from the entorhinal cortex. And then neurons, and those neurons synapse in a part of the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. And that pathway into the hippocampus is called the perforant pathway. That's essentially the input bus of the hippocampus. Um, so these axons that come in, if they're stimulated about 100 times, they demonstrate long-term potentiation, which means that it becomes easier to cause them. It's, it's become easier to cause the downstream neuron to fire as a result of stimulating them. So LTP is demonstrated by a stronger response. That summing up is called a population EPSP. And I want to just stop to explain this because this is mildly confusing. We've been talking about before the all or nothing principle and neurons either fire or don't fire. This population EPSP is something slightly different. It essentially has to do with, on average, so you stimulate the, these axons and you have to stimulate them at a certain frequency or a certain number of times to get the downstream neuron to fire. What this population EPSP has to do with essentially is that that amount of stimulation upstream is less as a, is, and it leads to uh, downstream action sooner or faster or easier. Um, and so it's still, a, these individual neurons are all still all or nothing, but the summation effects can be analyzed in, in, a, in a continuous kind of fashion. Does that make sense at all? That part is kind of confusing. But what I want to emphasize is this process is still the same all or nothing process we've been talking about before. But what happens is, as a result of this change, it requires less stimulation of these incoming axons to generate a response than it used to. So here's a picture of that. And here's that hippocampus that looks like a seahorse. And here's the endorhinal cortex and the input uh, coming this way. And um, so uh, this neuron um, is in the perforant path. And this neuron is in the dentate gyrus. And what's happening here is that that 100 pulses of this cause long-term potentiation at this synapse, which causes this, this connection to transmit more easily, in essence. And here's a graphic of what those voltages look like. Uh, and so before, um, um, long-term potentiation, you see this response, and you see a stronger response, which maintains to some extent over time. These are all bigger than this one. Meaning the, the same stimulation from the perforant pathway is generating a, longer, a larger response in the group of neurons. That's the population EPSP. So that's long-term potentiation that rapid firing of this incoming neuron changes the synapse. So let me tell you how that actually works. Because so far we haven't really talked about how synapses can change. We just talked about what they do. So the mechanism for LTP is the N-methyl D aspartate receptor, which if you remember is the metabotropic glutamate receptor, right? It controls a calcium channel, but it's a tricky calcium channel. The calcium channel is normally blocked by a magnesium ion. And normally, binding glutamate to the channel doesn't actually do anything. Because this ion is blocking the channel, it opens, but nothing goes through it. If the postsynaptic membrane is depolarized, and remember, it's going to be depolarized if there's an action potential, then the magnesium ion is temporarily ejected. And in that case, the, the channel's open, and if glutamate binds at that situation, um, then it can admit calcium ions. So, passage through the channel requires glutamate 
as well as an already depolarized postsynaptic membrane. Two conditions are necessary for the channel to open. So on that last slide, when you said glutamate does nothing, so you mean it does nothing by itself? Yeah, let me show you that in the picture. Okay. Yeah. Um, so here is the situation when the membrane is not depolarized. The magnesium ion blocks the channel. The glutamate binds on the channel, and it should open, but it doesn't. It doesn't do anything because this ion blocks all these ions from going through the channel. That's what I mean by saying it does nothing. The glutamate binds, but nothing can pass through. If the membrane is depolarized, this magnesium ion temporarily pops out. So the way to think about this is sort of like um, if your bathtub has a stopper, say, right? You can imagine that stopper being popped out. Like, you know, Suppose that your bathtub, let me see if I can make this example make any sense, but suppose your bathtub backs up. Your bathtub backs up when it's the stopper's in it, the stopper pops out, and it's floating around and whatever is backing up into your bathtub, right? And as that stuff drains, that stopper is going to end up back in the, the, the drain of your, your bathtub. But until that stuff has drained out, that stopper is no longer blocking the drain. That's what the magnesium ion is doing. Eventually, it ends up getting caught back in the channel and blocks it again. But while the membrane is depolarized, it's not in the channel. And if a glutamate, I, um, uh, if a glutamate molecule binds with the channel, at that time when the magnesium ion is gone, the calcium ions can sneak in, right? That's, so that's what's, that's what's complicated about the N NMDA receptor. That's what makes it less straightforward than the AMPA receptor. So you need two things, a depolarized membrane and glutamate for the NMDA receptor to work. So it makes some sense, because we know that in this process that the, the, the postsynaptic membrane is going to be depolarized because the postsynaptic membrane is being triggered by the strong neuron. And so this process is happening at the right time. What's missing is what calcium ions have to do with strengthening the synapse, right? So now I told you that these calcium ions are only coming into, into, the, into the, uh, the neuron during this event that's happening at the right time for long-term potentiation. But what, what, what's good about having calcium in the neuron? So what's good about having calcium in the neuron is that the calcium serves as a second messenger, and it triggers biochemical processes in the cell. And in particular, it triggers biochemical processes that have to do with where the AMPA receptors are on the cell. And the AMPA receptors are your primary ionotropic um, glutamate receptor. So this is the one that's doing all the work. This is that primary excitatory neurotransmission is happening through the AMPA channel. Um, so calcium can result in moving AMPA receptors around. It, it can also actually result in changes in the size and shape of dendritic spines. And so for instance, it can cause more dendritic spines to arbor around a neuron, um, which in turn, each one of those is receiving, um, receiving chemicals that are released in the synapse. And so each one of those is affecting the postsynaptic potential which strengthens the response. And then there's actually one more trick up the cell sleeve, and that is that um, nitrous, nitric oxide has a communicative role in the nervous system. We talked about that earlier. And that NO transfers back to the upstream neuron, the one that, the weak neuron. And it, by, and it modifies the upstream neuron, which is so the terminal button side of the upstream neuron changes, as well as the dendritic spine side of the downstream neuron. So that's tying it all together. The calcium ion sets this chain in motion, which results in more receptors on the postsynaptic surface, more emission of the neurotransmitter from the terminal button, and so that results in a stronger effect. So here's a picture of that. Um, here's an act, a neuron, and it's got a bunch of synapses each one of these eight here. And one of these is 
say, a strong synapse. And when that strong synapse is repeatedly fired, or when these synapses is fired repeatedly, when that neuron synapse is repeatedly fired, um, it opens up not only the EMPA receptors, but also the NMDA receptors. The calcium inflow causes increased density in EMPA receptors here, and increased density, um, increased emission of neurotransmitter on the other side as well. And this is what that looks like. So here is the synaptic cleft, and this is the postsynaptic neuron. And there's an amper receptor. This is that receptor that's receiving glutamate and letting ions in the, into the body whenever it receives glutamate. And here's the NMDA receptor. This is the one that only lets calcium in if it's unblocked. When glutamate binds the NMDA receptor, during a depolarization, calcium comes in. Calcium coming in moves amper receptors onto the, the synaptic cleft surface. And now, excuse me, you went from, in this schematic example, excuse me, you went from just having a couple of amper receptors to now having a whole bunch of them. And since each one of these, if they receive a glutamate ion, will allow, a glutamate a molecule will allow ions to flow in, now it's responding a lot more strongly to the glutamate that's present in the synaptic cleft it's really it's allowing a lot more ions to enter in, in, meaning that every time this neuron on the other side fires, the effect on the postsynaptic potential is larger than it was before. I want to briefly mention that there is also long-term depression. So if the postsynaptic membrane is weakly depolarized or hyperpolarized, another mechanism called long-term depression actually reduces the number of amper receptors in the dendritic spine reduces the amount of connections between those two neurons, has the opposite effect, weakens the synapse, in essence. So what I mean by that here is, so here's a frequency. This is a specific kind of example. But in this example, low frequencies cause long-term depression. And at some threshold frequency, you start seeing long-term potentiation instead. So, the right place at the right time strengthens the synapse. The wrong place, or the right place at the wrong time, uh, weakens the synapse, in essence. Does that make sense? Um, and so this makes sense, because you want to be able to strengthen connections that are functional, that lead to good outcomes. You want to be able to weaken connections that don't lead to good outcomes. So that's basically a mechanistic example of long-term potentiation, which is the basic um, way in which conditioning works, that kind of learning. And also an underlying mechanism of neuroplasticity in general, or how the brain changes over time, aside from the basic development of the brain. I want to switch into some other topics about learning. OK, good. Um, The basal ganglia we talked about a few weeks ago, we talked about how they select and inhibit behavioral programs. They suppress and enhance and suppress different motor options uh, to allow you to pick the right ones at the right times and to not do the wrong thing. Um, as a sequence of actions becomes well known or automated, then the basal ganglia can essentially select the whole behavioral pattern. Um, an example of this is, if you think about, this is kind of a harder example now than it used to be um, because people don't dial phone numbers as much as they used to. But if you, you probably at least have a couple of phone numbers that you know by heart. If you think about those, no, those phone numbers you know by heart, you just have to tell yourself to call the number. You don't have to think about the digits in order. You automatically trigger that. And sometimes I couldn't even tell you what that number is, but you put me in front of a phone and I dial the whole thing correctly, right? So the basal ganglia can trigger a more complex motor pattern. And so the basal ganglia can essentially take over the role of carrying out complex responses. And that's what, that in essence is what we mean when we talk about transferring uh, learning to the basal ganglia. It's not really that the basal ganglia are storing motor plans, because motor plans, as we mentioned, are stored in the motor cortex. It's not like they're storing sensory chains. 
because sensory chains are stored in sensory association cortex. But they're storing the decision tree that triggers more complicated patterns. So disrupting the vagal ganglia will disrupt instrumental learning and particularly things like big chains of, of learned behaviors. And here's a picture of that. I don't want to go into too much detail with this, but we talked about these basal ganglia structures, the globus pallidus and the putamen and the cauda nucleus. Um, and we talked about how they had a reciprocal connection back to the motor cortex. And so as this gets more complicated, they can trigger larger, more complex motor patterns that are still mediated by the motor cortex, but now they're triggering a much more complicated one. And that's why you can do these things without putting a lot of effort into them. So that's about all that I want to say about non-declarative memory. Uh, and I'd like to switch to declarative memory, which actually is, is what we spend a lot of time dealing with, although we're not going to talk about it in as much uh, detail uh, in this class. Because uh, it's a little bit less well understood, although we do understand it pretty well. So most of your memory, the stuff that you would actually call memory, is declarative in nature. It's complex relational memory. It's explicit. Uh, it's knowledge and events uh, and experiences. Um, these are the things that we actually are most interested in most of the time. Um, and so casually, these are the things we call memories. I want to mention two circuits in the brain that are very important for these memories. Um, the first is called the PAPES circuit. And PAPES demonstrated a closed loop coordinating multiple structures, most prominently the hippocampus, that was crucial for memory, and in particular is sufficient, meaning you have this, this loop, you're able, to, you're able to have episodic memories. Um, I mentioned that the endorhinal cortex is the input bus, essentially, of the hippocampus. There's a structure called the mammillary bodies. Um, these are uh, located really near the optic chiasm, um, and they're called mammillary bodies because they're shaped like breasts. Um, they're the output structure. Um, the, Anterior nucleus of the thalamus is also involved. And then finally, the cingulate gyrus, part of the cingulate cortex is involved. Um, and it's a loop, meaning it comes all the way back to the endorhinal cortex and back to the hippocampus. And this loop um, allows for um, storing and retrieving episodic memories. However, um, and as an organizing principle, sorry, um, in most right-handed individuals, we mentioned that the left hemisphere handles language, and the right hemisphere handles visual-spatial integration. There's more variability in memory, but in many people, there's a similar lateralization. So the left hemisphere is involved in verbal episodic memory, and the right hemisphere is involved in visual-spatial memory. Um, and so, uh, this is an example of a task from mice that gets at visual memory. It's called the Morris water maze. Um, here what's happening is you've got a tub of milky water. And in here is a platform, but the platform is under the surface of the water. So you can't see it because the water is milky. You drop a mouse in. The mouse will swim around and find the, um, the, the um, platform. And you take the mouse and you throw them in again. They'll swim straight to the platform pretty quickly. And that's visual spatial learning, because they're learning navigation in essence. A lesion to the right hippocampus will cause a really inefficient search pattern. They'll have trouble remembering, in essence, where the platform is. And they won't go straight back to it. They'll have to find it again. So this is kind of an analog to verbal episodic memory. They know that the platform is in a certain place, or they're supposed to learn that, but they're not able to remember where the platform is. They have to poke around until they find it. Um, and here, what it's just showing is that um, if you change the start position, this is really crucial to it, then the controls, even if you've dropped them in random places in the tub, they remember where the platform is in the tub, and so they go right to it. The lesion mice don't. If you drop them in the same place every time, it doesn't, it's not no longer an episodic memory task, it's just instrumental learning. Um, and so they actually do better in that task because what's impaired here is visual episodic memory, not, or declarative memory, 
not the non-declarative memory we've been talking about before. What I want to add to that is that there is a second circuit in the limbic uh, system. That second circuit centers around the amygdala. And it's, it's in essence what we were talking about last week. It connects the amygdala, the orbitofrontal cortex, and the dorsal median nucleus and the thalamus. And that circuit also plays a crucial role in um, episodic memory. And it's also sufficient for memory formation. Um, so have you all heard of HM, Henry Melison? He's a famous uh, patient with epilepsy or seizures. Uh, he had seizures that were intractable, meaning uh, they didn't respond to medications. He kept having seizures. He had surgery to remove part of his brain uh, to, to cure his seizures. And what they did was they took out the amygdala and hippocampus and some surrounding tissue on both sides of the brain. Uh, and that rendered him being densely amnestic, meaning that he had essentially no episodic memory. So he could read a newspaper, put it down, and a minute later pick up the same newspaper and have no recollection of having read it. And in fact, he would read the same newspaper over and over again, or do the same crossword puzzle over and over again, and have a jolly old time, because he had no memory of having done it before. He could tell the same joke over and over again. It was new memories that were impaired in HM. He was able to retain all his old memories, essentially. Everything that he remembered before his surgery was still there, but the new memories were no longer being stored. Um, he could also learn procedurally. So for instance, if he read a newspaper article, the second time he picked it up, he'd read through it faster. But he wouldn't realize that he was read through it faster because he'd already read it. He'd just be reading it faster. If you gave him a task like, um, like uh, say, sorting a bunch of blocks in a box, each time you do that task, you're going to get faster and faster at it. And so would he. But you would know conceptually that it was happening because you've done it over and over again. He would get faster and faster without having realized he'd ever done it before. And in fact, if you told him, he would not believe that he'd done it before. Although in his case, he was kind of aware of, um, of, of this, this, this problem. Um, so memory, this amnesia, as we meet it here, is amnesia for episodic memory, not for procedural learning. Um, and these circuits are not where the memory is stored, but they're responsible for converting the information into long-term memories, permanent memories. And so that doesn't happen for HM anymore. Um, as it turns out, his surgery knocked out both this amygdala or lateral pathway and this PAPES um, uh, hippocampal pathway. And that's why he can't remember anything. If you have one of those two pathways intact, you can remember things. But if you have both of them knocked out, uh, your episodic memory is really terrible. Um, so, a few more things about amnesia. Uh, formation of long-term memories is an active process. It occurs after the experience through a process of consolidation that's run by these, these structures like the hippocampal circuit, the PIP circuit. And so, disruption of a memory process can trigger two kinds of amnesia, retrograde and anterograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia means that you forget stuff that happens before the injury. It's temporarily graded. It takes about 20 minutes to remember things. So people who have, although it can take longer, and it depends on how severe the injury is. It's temporarily graded, meaning, suppose you have a serious head injury during a car accident. Your memory for the things that were most immediately before the car accident are most likely to be gone. And then there's a period at some point where they become fuzzy, and then they become clear again. You don't lose old memories and keep new memories. The memories are lost from the essentially from recent uh, or last in to is first out, if that makes sense. So that organic amnesia after a head injury, it can result in not remembering the day before the accident. But if you remember the day before the accident, but you forgot what happened when you were a kid, that's not organic amnesia. It can also be anterograde. So if that circuit is interrupted, then you can't remember new information. So this is memory for stuff that happened after the injury, which is most of the uh, the amnesia that uh, HM had. He had a little bit of this, but it was just for days you know, before the surgery. He had tons of this. He couldn't remember any new information. It's an active and continuous process. It's temporarily graded, meaning there's a slope of memory with very little memory 
right before the accident and progressively more and more. Very little memory right after the accident and progressively more and more. Um, so I can draw that for you really quickly. So what I'm saying there is, um, is suppose that this is time and this is where the accident happens and this axis is your percent of forgetting Right? So 100% forgetting means you don't remember anything. 0% forgetting means you remember everything. Tem what I mean by temporally graded is this. Um, you remember more stuff. There's less forgetting as you get further away from the accident in either direction. Okay, just a couple more slides. Um, the last thing that I want to mention is another kind of declarative memory, which is semantic memory. The difference between semantic and episodic memory is that there's no episode. There's no specific context. So if I ask you how much is 2 plus 2, you tell me 4. You don't tell me 4 because you remember the time your teacher told you 20 years ago that 2 plus 2 was 4. You tell me 4 because you know that that's the right answer. You don't tell me that the first president of the United States was George Washington because you were there, because you weren't there. You tell me that because you know that information. That's what I mean by semantic memory. So you don't remember how to spell the word um, perceive, uh, for instance, because you remember the first time you saw it in a book. You have, you have fact knowledge for how to spell perceive, or who the first president of the United States was, or or what the principal excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain is. These are all fact knowledge. That's semantic memory. The limbic structures are involved in formation and retrieval of memories, including semantic memories. But the information is stored neocortically. That should come as a surprise. Because I told you that information is stored in the same places where the perception happens, right? So you process language in the temporal lobe. Semantic memory that's language-based is going to be in the temporal lobe where you process that kind of information. There is a kind of uh, dementia called semantic dementia where these lateral temporal structures, not the limbic system, but these neocortical temporal structures where semantic information is stored, degenerate. And we talked about a, a few weeks ago about double dissociation, where there were two diseases, and one group was good at one thing and bad at the other, and the other group was the opposite. So, HM and people with semantic dementia are another example of a double dissociation. HM, who was the epilepsy patient who had the bilateral amygdala hippocampectomy, meaning that he had his amygdala and his hippocampus removed on both sides of his brain, he could not remember episode, episodic memory, meaning if you asked him what he had for breakfast yesterday, he couldn't tell you. That's, and there's an episode, what you had for breakfast yesterday. You ask him how to spell breakfast, that's fine. Or you ask him what breakfast means, that's fine. That's semantic knowledge. Essentially, the semantic dementia person has the opposite. They have episodic memory. Um, so like HM, even if you put cards up in front of him and asked him to point to what he had for breakfast yesterday, he couldn't tell you. With semantic dementia, you actually can handle that task. But what you can't do is say what breakfast means for you know, the, the defining characteristic of breakfast is that it's a meal eaten in the morning right after you wake up. So that's what, that maybe not exactly what semantic dementia entails, but the idea is that that semantic knowledge network in the temporal cortex is inhibited, is, is, is destroyed. And so they can remember episodes, but they can't remember fact information. HM can remember fact information, but he can't remember episodes. So it's a double dissociation. Uh, and it suggests that different structures are involved in these two things. In this case, the temporal cortex and the, uh, the medial temporal lobe or the limbic system. Okay? So that's memory. And we will come back to some of these concepts. Like when we talk about neurological disorders, we'll talk about Alzheimer's disease and how it affects memory. Um, but I want to give you an overview of, of memory. It's an important topic uh, in, in uh, physiological science.